if you've ever been through Daniel 11, it's quite a, quite a deal. But uh, it is, some people I think check out when they get to passages like Daniel chapter 11. But, uh, but I, I get really excited about it because of just the supernatural nature of the Bible. There's no other book anywhere in the cosmos that's like the Bible that is so supernatural and so powerful. And tonight we get to sort of dive into some of the supernatural part of the Bible. And I'm gonna say the part, but it's all supernatural. It, Lo, I come in the volume of the book is written of me. And like I was just praying, it's all inspired and God breathed. And so this evening, we're gonna see evidence that it's God breathed and not man breathed. Um, and it has to do with this truth that the Lord knows the beginning from the end. The Lord knows the whole uh, you know, picture. Right now, you and I, we just see through a glass darkly. In some ways, you might say we look at it linearly. That is, we look at the whole thing uh, through time on a timeline. But it seems that God exists outside of time, and, so, and he sees the whole picture. It's, it's like the difference if, in some ways, an illustration might be a parade. You know, if we're sitting in our lawn chairs, watching a parade go by, and watching the, you know, the bands, and the floats, and the firefighters, and the, you know, just everybody's going by, and, and you just kind of go, wow, one thing after another. And that's how we look at time. But God, he's up in the, you know, the Goodyear blimp, uh, looking down on the whole thing, and he sees the beginning from the end, and he sees the whole story, he knows the whole story, and he's orchestrating the whole story, uh, which is quite amazing, and, and I think it makes it what the Bible study uh, really exciting. And so uh, we're, we're gonna take a look at this, and it has much to do with history. From Daniel's perspective, um, Daniel chapter 11 is prophecy. From our perspective, Daniel 11, 1 through 35, um, is history. Uh, because this will happen, uh, you know, of course, after Daniel prophesies, um, you know, several hundred years, the whole thing will come down. Uh, after Daniel, but we, we, we know how the history would shake out. And it gets in amazing, exacting detail. And that's what we're gonna kind of see this evening. And you might say, well, the detail's the boring part. I think it's the exciting part. Every detail that's numbered here in Daniel 11 came to pass perfectly. In history, 134, somebody went through and counted all the things that were mentioned here in the first part of this chapter, Daniel chapter 11, verses one through 34. Um, and and the, of the things mentioned, there has to be 134 direct prophecies that had to come to pass. And all of them uh, came to pass perfectly. And we're gonna talk about all of them. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna count them, but uh, every little nuance of every little thing was counted by some people and they said 134. Um, if you want, you can go home and count them up. Uh, good luck with that. But uh, these are amazing prophecies. Daniel chapter 11, again, history to us, prophecy to Daniel. And so uh, chapter 11 basically will chronicle 150 years of warfare between two people groups. Uh, and, uh, and we'll kind of see how that divides up uh, and what have you. But um, the bottom line is um, we're gonna see kind of the springboard from chapter 10. Last Wednesday night, we saw Daniel, of course, you know, fasting and praying, and the, uh, the angel, the messenger angel, not named here, but maybe it's the angel Gabriel who was sent to go and give Daniel these bits of prophecy. But remember, he was withheld by the prince of Persia, which was the demonic power of Persia, and uh, was withholding this angel from getting to Daniel to prophesy, uh, to get this prophecy. But uh, who came to the res rescue, anybody? Michael the archangel stood up there, uh, as it says there in verse 13 of chapter 10. And we saw, you know, that's really the drama of chapter 10 is just getting ready for the prophecy of chapter 11 to be given by this messenger angel, probably uh, Gabriel. But this angel's gonna announce, uh, starting with three kings uh, from the, you know, this, um, uh, you know, Persian empire and what have you. So let's take a look. Daniel chapter 11, verse one. There it says, also I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. Now right out of the gate, um, we have to get the, you know, the I and the him sort of st straightened out. Um, remember, uh, this is probably still you know, the same angel talking from chapter 10. 
Uh, if you remember in verse 21, but I will show thee that which was noted in scripture of truth. There is none that holdeth with me these things, but Michael, your prince, also I in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and strengthen him. In some ways, you almost wanna put chapter 10 and 11 in one chapter. It would make a huge chapter, but the story kind of glues together pretty, and, and you don't wanna separate the two. So just a reminder, it's just the angel, probably Gabriel, just c- continually talking and he doesn't stop. So that's how we know who's talking in chapter one, or chapter 11, verse one. Um, so what does he say? He, the angel came, and what did he do? In the first year of Darius, I, even I, stood to confirm and to strengthen him. This is an interesting thing because Darius um, would be uh, the one that the angel would come to strengthen. And that's an interesting question. Does God strengthen leaders? Um, And you might say, well, of course, God strengthens. But does God strengthen secular leaders? Um, It's always funny to me how people get all up in a tizzy about, you know, elections and who's in office and, you know, and who we're looking for and what we want. But um, it's true, the Lord raises people up and the Lord raises people down, puts them down. Um, and, he, um, and he uses very flawed people. Um, one thing you need to be careful of, you know, when you're voting is to make the mistake of thinking any candidate's perfect or any candidate is the one that's all perfect without sin or, or you know, so much better than the other. Man, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's no one righteous, no, not even one. I mean, God raised up Jewish leaders in the history of Israel that would make some of our leaders today blush. You know, when you think of Samson, a guy that God raised up to be the leader of Israel for 20 years, but man, he was, he was kind of a rascal. I mean, uh, you know, it's pretty tough when, when uh, you know, he's going down to the enemies, uh, the Philistines, and makes a sort of a, a bet with them, you know, with, a, with sort of a riddle. And the guys figure out his riddle. And so he owes them 10 pieces of, you know, or 10, you know, sets of clothing. So Samson, the leader of, of Israel, goes and slaughters 30 men. Uh, takes their clothes off them, puts them in a bag, all bloodied up and everything, and then brings them to the guys he made the deal with. Okay, here's your clothes. Um, That'd be a tough day. You know, if you're in the Oval Office trying to press conference, you know, uh, okay, let's see. Well, um, he just didn't really like the style of clothing that they were wearing. Like, how do you put spin on that? Uh, That's a bad day. Or, you know, Samson just going down to the enemy country and just sleeping with whoever he wants to find. He's got all these women that he's sleeping with and ends up with Delilah, the prostitute. And, you know, I mean, extremely embarrassing if you're a Jew. Man, that's our leader. Yeah, he's the one that judged Israel. You know, or, or David even. David who did so many great things. But, you know, much of his great kingdom was really sort of tainted with his adulterous affair, which ended up in murder and, um, and the loss of his child and the rebellion of his son, Absalom. And, you know, David ends up walking out of Jerusalem barefoot with sackcloth and ashes and in total shame. Um, again, another tough day in the Oval Office. How do you explain that? Walking away from Jerusalem in total shame. So, you know, God uses very flawed people and raises them up and puts them down. The reason I say that is because, you know, one of the things we shouldn't get all up in a tizzy when leaders come and go. That's, that's what God's been doing for millennia. So it's interesting to me that Darius is strengthened by this angel. He came to strengthen Darius. And Darius, by the way, was in fact a very powerful and, uh, and you know, great king. Uh, Darius, oftentimes referred to as Darius the Great, but, um, but then we learn about these three kings along with Darius. Let's check this out. So he came to strengthen Darius, verse one. And now will I show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia. And the fourth king shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. Okay, now we've got this list of kings. And for you his, history buffs, I'm gonna be giving you a lot of history tonight. Uh, hopefully not too boring, but I love this stuff. So these are the kings that are referred to, not in, by name except for you know, Darius here uh, in, this, in verse two, but these are the kings. You got to start with Cyrus, Cambyses, Darius, and then Xerxes. And by the way, Xerxes, uh, commonly uh, known as Xerxes the Great, was the fourth king of the... Um, uh, now, now there's other names. You know, the Bible calls it, you know, Persia. Um, some people, historians refer to this era as two things. 
the Achaemenid, uh, Achaemenid Empire and also the first Persian Empire. Um, so you'll read about these time periods and you go, who are we talking about? What, what's, what's the uh, Achaemenid uh, er, er, Empire? I can't even say it. Um, but just say the first Persian Empire. That's, that's the best way to remember it. Uh, but Xerxes the Great, he's the one. And if you look at a map at this period, they really conquer much of the whole known world at that time. Uh, these guys uh, have a huge empire. And it's true, this prophecy came to pass Perfectly, we're already off at the races here with prophecy. You know, predicting this fourth king that will uh, become exceedingly strong and his riches and his wealth would be way more than the others. And Xerxes, um, also called Ahasuerus. The reason Ahasuerus might be, um, you know, um, important for you to know his other name uh, is because that's the name he's known in in Ezra 4.6, but he's also in Esther Chapter one, verses one through 12, it's that same dude, uh, which is kind of important on the whole thing if you know the story of Esther. But this guy, how did he become powerful and what happened? Well, he instituted tax reforms. This was the first thing. Uh, and he became very powerful and, and he trained two million warriors over a four year period and built special uh, military weapons, including these, he did some amazing stuff, like these ancient people. He built these really long bridges made out of boats or barges. He would take boats and then build decks over, like boats all lined up, and then he would march his army places that nobody thought you could mark, march. Um, now, when I say two million warriors, you're gonna hear all kinds of controversy about this. The ancient writers say that he had two million or 2.5 million soldiers. Um, And that's all over the ancient writings of the ancient world. Now, in modern times, people say that they were exaggerating. Um, But I don't know. You know, um, as I read history, one thing I've noticed, and especially when it comes to the Bible, is all these so-called modern historians, they love to sort of diminish some things in history, especially when it comes to the Bible. Well, we know now that there was no way that in such and such a date they could have done this and that. And they do that all the time to the Bible to try to you know, take the Bible down a notch or two only to find out archeologically or whatever every time the Bible was right. Uh, so I don't really like listening to these Discover Channel, History Channel, uh, his so-called historians. Some of them are good. Uh, many of them are really lame and they're just always trying to bash the Bible. Just be aware of that. You should be aware of that. Um, so the big debate rages and in modern recent years, they've said, oh yeah, the, the you know, the, the The Persian army here, uh, though the ancients claimed that there was two and a half million soldiers, some say it was probably nowhere close to that, probably closer to 300,000, which is still a big army, but that's the big debate. And you say, well, why why does it matter? Well, one of the most famous battles happened with uh, Xerxes, if you remember, um, the Battle of Thermopylae. Uh, what, an, what an amazing you know, uh, thing against the Greeks. And, and, and did you see what we just read here? He's gonna stir up his wealth and his power up against the realm of Greece. So far in Daniel's prophecies, we've already see, seen him in Daniel chapter two, Daniel seven, and also in Daniel chapter eight. Remember the, the he goat that would come and smite you know, the ram? This has all been pictured already. This is review of old prophecies Daniel's already talked about, but now he's getting a whole nother version of this. And we're zooming in every time to more of a detailed picture of especially this Greek empire. And, and we'll see why that's important here in a minute. But basically, this is the Bible in verse you know, two, talking about how he's gonna stir up against the, the, the newly empowered Greek, Greek empire. Now, um, the reason Thermopylae, by the way, was such a famous battle is it was basically this way lopsided battle. But the Greeks were known to be quite the warriors and they were smart and all that. While um, you know, the, the Persian empire and Xerxes was known to have two and a half million men. So that they just would throw bodies at war and who cares how many people die because you got two and a half million soldiers, so whatever. Um, but the reason Thermopylae became so um, you know, uh, famous is because when you know, the Medo-Persian Empire was coming to take on the Greeks, or I should say the Persian Empire by this time, uh, the Greeks very strategically figured out how to overcome the massive numerical discrepancy some say that the Greeks had 6,000 soldiers at this battle, 6,000. So in the most conservative uh, estimations, uh, it was 300,000 to 6,000. That's a pretty big lopsided battle. 
And that's the most conservative. Some say it was a million against 6,000. You'll hear even uh, some against 300. And there was a last stand at the end that was more like a 1,500 stand. But it's, it's, a, it's an amazing battle. But, but the Greeks figured out, if, since they have such a huge army, let's go to this place at Thermopylae um, where the pass that you'd have to go through this, this range um, at its widest point was only 200 yards. Um, and so the Persians had to come through this very narrow pass in small numbers, which would then could be able to allow the Greeks to sort of, you know, attack uh, in more reasonable, uh, they didn't get all the, you know, million people attacking all at one time. And it was really brilliant. And not only that, the Greek forces were superior. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's kind of an amazing story. But it's, isn't it cool? The Bible really is talking about, at the end of verse two, the battle of Thermopylae as he's stirring up against the Grecian empire. So again, once again, so far we've covered a bunch of prophecies. We got the fourth king, which is Xerxes, three other kings, Cyrus, Cambyses, Cambyses and Darius. And um, you got, you know, the, um, uh, the, the Greeks. Now, once the Greeks come up, then uh, Daniel starts talking about that in verse three, or Daniel writes what the angel told him in verse three. And it says, and a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up even for, uh, for others beside those. Okay, now we just had a bunch of other prophecies that Daniel hears. There's a, there's a mighty king um, that's gonna stand up with great dominion and do whatever he wants. Does anybody wanna take a stab? Who's that king? Right, Alexander the Great. So far, you know, we should be tracking this because we've been through it several times. And, and you know, um, of course, Daniel 2, it was the, it was the um, you know, the belly of brass talked about there on the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. In Daniel chapter seven, it was, you know, this beast. And, and remember the, the beast uh, the, 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 that was called a leopard um, at that time, which speaks of its speed and rapidity by which it would attack, which Alexander was in fact that. Um, but in Daniel chapter eight, remember the, uh, the beast that had the, 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 the four wings that were plucked up? This is now where we're at again. And the four wings in Daniel eight, and here um, it says, his kingdom shall be divided to the four winds of heaven. These are the same four, the four winds, the four wings, and um, it's the four, does anybody remember? Generals of Alexander the Great. Um, now this is, there's a lion, this, therein lies kind of an amazing story, by the way. Um, um, and by the way, in chapter eight of Daniel, I should say, there was chapter seven and eight, I'm confusing the two. Chapter seven was the, you know, the beast. Chapter eight, remember the, the goat, the he goat with the notable horn? That was also Alexander the Great. So we've been talking about Alexander the Great a whole lot in the book of Daniel. But uh, if you recall, Alexander the Great died without a qualified heir. We went over this, I think, on a Sunday. Um, you know, remember when they asked him, who will secede you? When he was lying there in his deathbed, um, he said, you know, the strongest or to the strong. Who's gonna get the kingdom? To the strong, which is very ambiguous. Like, what does that mean? Um, well, um, some would say it should have gone to his half-brother, Philip uh, Aridaeus, but he was, um, some said, mentally ill somehow. Uh, so he wasn't able to take over the kingdom. Uh, Alexander's two son, illegitimate Hercules by Bassina and the daughter of Darius, um, the, the young Alexander, um, uh, also was uh, by Roxana, so there was two sons, but those two young sons of Alexander the Great were murdered within 13 years after their father's death. So, so there was still there was years of speculation even after he died. Who's going to take over the kingdom? Well, those two sons were killed, and after 22 years of fighting, then Alexander's four generals divvied up the the lands, and we went over that. Um, uh, by the way. Um, so so go, we go from Xerxes, uh, this, this guy here, uh, that's the main mention, uh, the king, and that's actually a relief they have uh, in Iran uh, right now, that you can go to, if you wanna go to Tehran uh, and go see in the museum at Tehran. Not really recommended a good vacation. But, um, but, um, but then we've got um, Alexander the Great, now he's, um, he's, uh, you know, he's divided up the empire into these four kingdoms. Now, now remember, um, all that to say, 
Um, the, the four generals, the, there's two that kind of don't matter as much. Cassandra and Lysimachus, Europe and Asia Minor, they don't really come into play in Daniel 11. And here's why. We're zeroing in on a character that's gonna come. Um, you guys know him, we studied him last Sunday and, and weeks before, Antiochus Epiphanes or Antiochus uh, Epiphanes, however you wanna say that. Uh, but the two groups that are, uh, that are gonna be all about Daniel 11 are the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. Uh, Ptolemy was one general, Seleucus was another. And uh, basically you got a picture, the Ptolemies were down in Egypt, they took that region, and the Seleucids were up in Syria um, and over in Babylon. But really Syria was where their main uh, area was. Now if you know, if you know, what nation lies between Egypt and Syria? Anybody? Israel. And this is, this is why this is so important. Remember, the whole book of Daniel is about the Jews, the holy city of Jerusalem, and Israel as a nation. That's what the book of Daniel is about. We don't read anything about the Gentiles, really, or very little to, uh, having to do with anything but Daniel's people and the holy city of Jerusalem. And that's why this, these, the, the two I've marked there with orange, it's because they're gonna trounce over Israel for a long, long time. These, these four generals divide up and you know, some history sort of unfolds. Um, and, uh, and, and then it says, you know, uh, that the, the, you know, those four, the four winds of heaven will be uh, you know, for his kingdom and then plucked up for even others beside those. So who are the others? After the four generals, um, the kings started to fight or the generals started to fight one another, especially the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. And we start to read about that here in verse um, five. And it says, and the king of the south shall be strong. That's the one, the Ptolemy in Egypt. And one of his princes, uh, and he shall be strong above him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. Um, and in the end of years, they shall join themselves together. For the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king's, king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand nor his arm, but she shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that begat her, and he that strengthened her in these times. Huh? Huh? What? What did we just read? Okay, uh, I'm gonna try to, uh, this is the first time I'm gonna do this, so I'm gonna try to graph this out just a little bit to help us sort of understand a, a little bit what's going on here. So, um, so in verse five, it says, you know, the king of the south shall be strong. So the king of the south, remember the, the Ptolemies, king of the north, solutions. Um, now the first one that we're talked about there in verse six, in the end of the years, they shall join themselves together for the king's daughter of the south. Now the king is Ptolemy II there in the south and he sends his uh, daughter, you know, um, who, um, who happens to be named Bernice um, and she is sent over to Antiochus II. This is not Antiochus Epiphanes. There's a bunch of Antiochuses coming. Uh, Antiochus is the fourth is the one we're most interested in. So just hang in there. Uh, we're gonna talk about a bunch of these Antiochuses. But, um, but the Bible is telling us great de t detail. I remember I was teaching at a Bible school once uh, years ago uh, uh, and they wanted me to teach Daniel 11. <laughs> and uh, um, I was, going, I was about, uh, getting into about as deep as we are tonight and this one guy raises his hand. He's like, why would we even care about any of this? Like, and, and I thought, you know, he's right. I, I need to explain why we care about it. And I have a little bit, but why do we care about this? Because the Bible tells us about it. Like just that alone should be enough. If it's in the Bible, it matters, right? Um, that's, that's just something we assume right out of the gate. Number two, um, I think this is important to know because um, just, just the Bible prophecy is accurate. Um, that's, that's, that's something we'll talk about here because see, now we're getting into some serious detail. What I just told you is, you know, basically there was a political marriage between Antiochus II, um, which by the way, he was called Antiochus the Theos uh, as well. Uh, Antiochus II, because he thought he was a god and what have you. Um, and he reigned 262 to 246 BC-ish, right around there. And Ptolemy II, um, he was also called Ptolemy Philadelphus, uh, the daughter of, uh, 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 sends his daughter Bernice, 
And, um, and, and, and it's really quite a dr- dramatic deal. You know, if you, if you like soap operas, just read Daniel chapter 11. Um, Antiochus was required, he was already married by this time, by the way. And so they send Bernice and he's like, what am I supposed to do, I'm already married. Um, they say, divorce your wife and marry Bernice. Uh, so he divorces his wife, Laodicea, not a, not a church. Uh, that's actually a woman at this time. And she, Laodicea, is, is bummed out that her husband, Antiochus II, dumps her for Bernice. Um, Bernice was unable to prevail against Laodicea, though. She gets married, and Laodicea poisoned Antiochus and murdered Bernice. A little drama. A uh, little, little uh, woman scorn, I guess. Um, <laughs> And also, she, uh, she set her eldest son, Seleucus II, Seleucus II, uh, on the throne 246 to 226 BC, okay? So we'll put him on the chart here in a second. Now, one of the things I want to remind you about this is, so this, and this is, again, part of the why is this all this stuff important, is this is where the critics of the Bible scream with total freaked out uh, craziness. The book of Daniel, especially Daniel chapter 11, is a forgery. It cannot have been written by Daniel, you know, in the years that he claimed to have write, written them. And the main reason, the 134 exact prophecies about the, the Seleucid Empire and the Ptolemaic Empire, um, the exact prophecies we're reading right here about Bernice and, and the daughter that doesn't quite make it and she won't retain her power, uh, neither will she stand. Uh, but then, you know, he will be, he that strengthened her in these, like this is all detail of what exactly happened. So the, this, the critics of the Bible say this is a forgery. Now, what I love about this particular chapter, because parts of Daniel, it depends on what date you're talking about, but does anybody remember when the Septuagint um, was written, the Greek translation of the Old Testament? The Greek translation of the Old Testament was 285 to 270 BC. That's how long it took them to translate, you know, the original language of the Bible into the Greek language. Um, but that we, nobody, nobody doubts the dating of the Septuagint. That's even the most secularist of secular. Uh, they know when the Septuagint was written. The reason I love this is because this all starts to happen. This all happens, you know, a, like after even we had the Septuagint. Um, in other words, um, if, if there's people saying, well, we know that this was written, you know, before, uh, or after the, the fact, so that he knew all the details. It's a total lie. Uh, because the Bible, uh, the proof in the pudding. By the way, there's another proof that I like too. Um, and we'll talk about that when we come to the abomination of desolation. That's a big proof of how this, this is not a forgery or anything like that. Uh, but do you understand that that's an important argument? If you're in college and somebody tries to say the book of Daniel is a forgery, just say the Septuagint, and that'll make them sweat because everybody knows Septuagint was 285 to 270. That's not even up to debate. And many of these prophecies, all of these prophecies we're reading, chapter 11, verses one through 35, happened after the Septuagint was already published. And the book of Daniel was in the Septuagint. So that's an important thing. Well, all that to say, um, you know, basically we got this uh, crazy drama of Bernice, and now we end up with kind of a whole new uh, set of leaders and what have you. I told you that, you know, Antiochus II, you know, his, his ex-wife murdered him and she put her son Seleucus II in power. Um, and then that brings us to uh, verses seven and eight, uh, which we got new leaders here, verse seven. But out of the branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north and shall deal against them and shall prevail. So basically, Ptolemy III um, here, in our, if you look at our chart, he's, uh, he seeks revenge for his sister, Bernice, who was murdered down there, okay? And he, he will prevail against. So Ptolemy III, brother Bernice, conquers the north, Seleucid II, who was appointed by the, you know, Laodicea, the mom that was bitter. Uh, in verse eight, and shall carry also uh, captives into Egypt, their gods, which, uh, with their princes, with their precious vessels of silver and of gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. 
So the king of the south shall come into his kingdom and shall return into his own land. So Ptolemy the third would be more successful than Seleucus the second, and that came to pass exactingly. Um, now when uh, Ptolemy um, conquers the north, um, it says here, this always cracks me up in the Bible, in like in verse um, eight, where it says, and um, they carried away their gods captive. Isn't that funny? Like, aren't you glad we serve a God that can't be carried away in captivity? Oh no, someone stole God. <laughs> what are we gonna do? You know, I mean, uh, that, that always cracks me up. Um, uh, you know, it was, it was uh, Rachel who stole Uncle Laban's gods and Laban had to go rescue them. And uh, it's a whole nother story, but I'm, I just, I'm so glad I don't serve a God that I have to, to rescue. Um, but anyway, so Ptolemy the third, um, basically, um, you know, in 245, he, you know, uh, he, you know, he goes and invades that, uh, that region, spoils. By the way, uh, history tells us 4,000 talents of gold, 40,000 talents of silver, and 2,500 idols did uh, Ptolemy uh, the third steal from Seleucus the second. Like, he ripped them off big time. And tons, I mean, that's a lot of money if you, uh, if you think about it. So these uh, included some uh, Egyptians uh, by Cambyses, uh, 200 years earlier, 280 years earlier, uh, and um, and and they they continue to be rivals for a lot of years. These two these two guys. Well, that brings us to verses nine and ten. So it says, "So the king of the south shall come into his kingdom and shall return into his own land, but his son shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come and overflow." and pass through. Then shall he return and be stirred up even to his fortress. <laughs> now, um, I, I, there's a lot of detail here and we don't have time to go into it all, but um, if we fast forward now to chapter uh, 11 verses nine through 13 really, we're talking about um, Ptolemy the fourth and Ptolemy the fifth in these, th these uh, four verses here. And basically these, these next verses are just talking about the continual wars that go on, and, and if you really wanna do some deep study, you can see the description of these wars. Like when it says they came up and went through, they literally went through the Ptolemy Empire, you know, solutions, and, um, and uh, they did exactly, exactly how the Bible says. Um, so that brings us, you know, from Seleucus the third all the way to Antiochus the third. As we keep reading, uh, verse eleven: the king of the south shall be moved with choler and shall come forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north. Um, and he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. And when he uh, hath taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up. That means pride, always the downfall. And he shall cast down many ten thousands, but he shall not be strengthened by it. For the king of the north shall return and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and with much riches. So this is where we, we kind of, you know, verses nine through 13, we're kind of crashing through the Talmuds and solutions that are going back and forth in battle and, um, and with great detail, it's, it's explained here. And then it brings us to verse 14. And in those times, there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Um, and also the robbers of the, thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. Now, now there's a change of language here that you need to take note of. In verse um, 14, remember the angels telling Daniel all this stuff. And he says to Daniel, by the way, in verse 14, you know, the king of the north, they're gonna stand up for the king of the south, but the robbers of thy people that's the Jews, that's Daniel's people, uh, shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. So, so now we have to understand that this warring between the Talmuds and Seleucids is starting to affect the Jews in Jerusalem uh, as the speed bump between these cultures that are battling it out. Um, and so we start to see the next section you know, of these uh, uh, verses 14 through 16. Um, now we're touching the Jews a little bit. Uh, in verse 15, it says, so the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities and the arms of the south shall not withstand neither his chosen people, who's that? The Jews, Israel, neither shall there be any strength to withstand, 
but he, sh he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land, which is where? Israel, which is by his hand uh, shall be consumed. So that's the thing. Um, you know, Ptolemy uh, is defeated by Antiochus III. Antiochus III is called Antiochus the Great. Um, and he defeats Egypt, but also uh, starts to conquer the walled cities in Israel. And that's, that now we're starting to get closer to home and a little more dialed in uh, to where, what's the most important part of this story. Um, so verse 17. Um, by the way, I'm, I'm skipping a lot of things, you know, um, uh, the, in verse 14 there, when it says, you know, the, they'll stand up against the land, um, you know, the many that stood up against the king of the south included Antiochus and his ally, um, Philip of Macedon as well, rising among all these vassals of, uh, in Egypt in 200 BC. Um, but, there, you know, this is where, um, uh, you know, there were huge troops and huge armies. If you're, if you're into military warfare and stuff like that, um, these battles, it almost seems like in the Bible, okay, so so-and-so attack. You picture these little ragtag armies going back and forth. These are huge battles. 100,000 troops at Sidon in 198 BC. Um, but nobody was able to stand against Antiochus III. That's why he was called the Great. Um, and, and these battles are, are uh, you know, brutal and horrible. Um, the, the title of the glorious land there in verse 16 is used elsewhere in the Bible. Daniel 8, 9, Jeremiah 3, 19. It's one of the, the idioms of, of, that's talking about Israel and what have you. But now in verse 17, Antiochus III is finally gonna be defeated, um, but not by one of the Ptolemies. The Ptolemies are starting to be sort of phased out a little bit. And the Seleucid Empire, the Antiochuses, they're getting more and more powerful. But now this is where the story, you're gonna recognize some of this from history. Verse 17, it says in verse 17, uh, he shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him, thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of women, corrupting her, but she shall not stand on his side, neither before him. After this shall he turn his face to the isles and shall take many, but a prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him. <laughs> okay, so what's going on? In verse 17, in 197 BC, Antiochus III set out with, with a fleet to attack Cilicia, Lycia, and Caria, uh, which were under Egyptian control, by the way, at that time. But he, he uh, sort of encountered a disastrous uh, a defeat, which Antiochus III wasn't really used to that. Um, and um, this defeat uh, was mainly because of an upstart power, a little group that was starting to get, become more powerful, a little group called the, Rome, the Romans. This is where the Romans first start really being seen uh, in, in history. So um, we read about here, it, this Antiochus sends his daughter down uh, in this, the old, let's send my daughter down to the Ptolemies again and see how that works out. This is the second round of that. So he sends his daughter, anybody know the daughter's name? Cleopatra. Um, she's sent down, this is, she's in the Bible. That just, uh, Elizabeth Taylor's in the Bible. Anyway, <laughs> no, just, do you, anybody old enough to see the Richard Burton, Elizabeth Taylor movie? Yeah, um, if, uh, if you wanna watch the movie, it's kind of telling verse 17 and 18. Um, but that actually happened. Uh, and Cleopatra sent down, now it's a crazy story because um, it says here that she would be called the daughter of women corrupting her. Um, she's sent down there to marry this kid. Um, and, uh, and, you know, everybody's kind of thinking, by the way, um, Antiochus sends her down there with the intention of not really having her find romance and being married and loving, living down there. She, sent, she was sent down there to be a spy. They basically said, tell us, get us information about what's going on down there so that we can defeat our enemies. Well, she goes down there and lo and behold, this kid sort of grows up and she falls in love with him. And uh, she ends up, you know, uh, staying on their side. And that's exactly what the Bible says. That, um, they would uh, corrupt her, but she would not stand on his side, you know, her father's side, neither before him. Now, um, so what happens? Um, when Antiochus gives Cleopatra and then realizes his daughter's not 
gonna stand on his side, he freaks out and he's really upset. So he turns his attention to the isles that I just told you about, Cilicia, Lycia, and Caria. Um, and uh, he goes and says, I, if I can't do that, then I'm gonna take on these isles and just take them from the Egyptian area or people, the Ptolemies. Well, he bumps into the Romans and he fails and he's defeated there. And so basically this, this whole arranged marriage thing bombs out again. The groom was 10 years old, by the way, and they consummated their marriage. That's why it's kind of a corruption that's talked about here. Um, along with um, uh, Kole, Syria, Phoenicia, and Judea as a dowry. They, got, they, they not only got Cleopatra, but all these places, including parts of Judea, the Jews, as a dowry and in hopes that he could actually annex Egypt. So there's, this is all, the reason I'm going into these, all these details are kind of in here in sort of a cryptic sort of way. I mean, some of it you can kind of figure out, but a lot of it's going, wow, what are we talking about? This woman who's the daughter of women and corrupted and all that stuff. It's, when you see the history lined up, um, you know, basically you, you see it perfectly unfold as the Bible says. So when it says, um, she, but she shall not stand on his side, she became devoted wife and, and sided with Egypt uh, and her new ally, Rome, Cleopatra, uh, sort of signed on with, with the Romans and that's where Richard Burton comes in and all that stuff. Well, anyway, so in 196 BC, Antiochus, um, you know, goes and turns his anger uh, to, um, you know, to these islands, but also uh, he fights more of the Romans and the Bible talks about that a little bit as well, um, where, you know, his army starts to suffer huge defeats and he's losing all kinds of power. Europe and Asia Minor, he had to surrender all the territory of the west of the Taurus Mountains and pay huge money uh, um, uh, in his ruin. Like he's starting to become very ruined and then he ends up dying. Let's take a look, verse 18. It says, um, after this shall his face turn to the isles, like we said, uh, verse 19, then he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. Um, what, how did this guy die? Well, this is funny. Here's this guy who was all over the world battling and fought dangerous wars and was kind of an amazing thing. You know, this guy, um, Antiochus III, but he stumbles on some stairs and dies. Just like the Bible says. In his own land, he's just kind of walking down some stairs, boom, dies. Um, and the Bible called that one in great detail. Like, that's amazing to me. In verse 19, he stumbles, and, and when it says he shall not be found, that means he was dead. Now, uh, verse 20, then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes uh, in, in the glory of the wisdom, but within few days he shall be destroyed neither in anger nor in battle. So um, let that be a warner to anybody who's raising taxes. Uh, <laughs> I won't mention any names. Um, but, but as it turns out, verse 21 is where we start. Now, who comes after him? Antiochus the fourth. Um, also called Antiochus Epiphanes, okay? So, um, so now we're starting to see these verses get to where we, our goal, Antiochus the, the, the fourth, verse, uh, verse 21. I'm trying to catch up on my, my graph here. So I think we're right there. Yeah, verse 21 through 35 is gonna focus in on Antiochus Epiphanes. Let's see what it says, verse 21. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, uh, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Does this ring a bell? Now, one of the things you gotta do, and this is where our mind starts to bend just a little bit. And, and one of the reasons I think it's good that we kind of looked at the end of the book before the beginning. Have you ever read the last chapter of a book and then read the, we did that. On Sunday, we looked at the, the end of this chapter, verses 36 to the end, and we saw who we're really getting to, the Antichrist. And it's way off in the future. But this guy, Antiochus Epiphanes, is gonna be a picture, an illustration of this coming Antichrist. And so it's, it's actually kind of beneficial. I, I gave you a bunch of the details over last Sunday, also our Prophecy Update, we talked about who this Antichrist is gonna be. But now we get to see Antiochus Epiphanes and you're gonna see some alarming detail that's exactly what the Antichrist will do. When the Antichrist comes after the rapture of the church, what's the first thing he's gonna do, anybody? 
peace treaty, right? He's gonna sign a peace treaty. He's gonna win peaceably. And he's gonna make everybody think he's wonderful. And the Jews are gonna go, oh, this is our Messiah. And they'll sign the, the peace treaty. And, and how does this guy come in? It, it, nobody puts him in power. He just comes in peaceably, it says there, verse 21, to obtain the kingdom by flatteries. That's using his mouth. And that's exactly what Antichrist is gonna do. So, so, so far, we're paralleling Antiochus Epiphanes with the things we learned about Antichrist in the future. Very interesting. And verse 22, with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. Um, now, what's this prince of the covenant thing uh, all about? Um, well, as it turns out, um, uh, the prince of the covenant in verse 22 um, refers to something he did. He, he killed a, a prince uh, referring to Onias III, the high priest in uh, 171 BC. Um, and that, that's what verse 20, 22 is talked about. Now, when we talk about the covenant, um, what are we talking about? We're talking about the covenant God made with the Jews, specifically the Abrahamic covenant. Remember, God said, I will make of you, Abraham, a mighty nation. I'll bless all the nations of you. And, I, you know, um, it's, it's the unconditional covenant God's made with the Jews. And so they're called the people of the covenant. And this was one of the princes of the covenant that was killed by this guy in verse 22. And verse 23, and after the league um, made with him, he shall work deceitfully and he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. Um, you know, um, it's kind of interesting making, make, you know, he, he comes to power using deceit. That's exactly what Antichrist is gonna do. Unlike his fathers, Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes, um, he robbed the richest places of the country under his control. He literally went and just took money from people under his kingdom and attacked his enemies when they least expected it. It was, it was uh, you know, at that time considered to be sort of, remember how the British would line up and they'd shoot, you know, across a field and that was gentlemanly warfare? Well, even in these days, there were ways to fight and there were ways not to fight, but Antiochus IV broke all the rules, the Geneva Conventions, if you would. He would use deceit and he attacked people when they least expected it. And he got money and wealth from people, just ripped, he ripped them off and got power that way. Um, so there was a power contest, by the way, between Antiochus's two nephews, Ptolemy the sixth and Ptolemy uh, um, the seventh um, uh, for control of Egypt. Um, but verse 24 predicts what he's gonna do. It says in verse 24, he shall enter peaceably upon the fattest places of the province and he shall do that which his fathers have not done nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches. Yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. Um, and, uh, and so Antiochus is now... Um, back in his own land, and we're gonna see him turn his, his anger toward the Jews. After the death of his mother, Cleopatra, Ptolemy IV receives bad advice regarding Antiochus IV, who uh, basically wiped out his army. And Antiochus conquered Ptolemy and the Alexandrians down in Egypt and brought, um, you know, his, his brother, Ptolemy Fiscon, you don't have to remember this, it won't be a test, um, to the Egyptian throne. So now, Suddenly, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, he's got control of Egypt, finally. He's controlling Egypt because he put his own people in power um, uh, and, and, uh, and is kind of getting more and more powerful through deceit and warfare. Well, it goes on in verse 26. Yea, they that feed the portion of his meat shall destroy him and his army shall overflow and many shall fall down slain. And both of these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief as they shall speak lies at one table, but shall not prosper for that the, yet, the end shall be at the time appointed. Um, so, um, so those are the people we were just talking about, these two sort of uh, um, basically uh, family members that were fighting with each other. Then verse 28, he shall return into his land with great riches and his heart shall be against the holy covenant. That's the Jews and shall do exploits and return to his own land. At the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it will not be as the former or as the latter, for the ships of Chittim shall come against him, or Chittim. Um, who are the ships of Chittim? Anybody know who that is? Huh? 
It's technically, look, if you look it up, it's technically the Romans coming. Uh, the Romans are coming. The Romans are coming. Uh, for the, the ships of Chittim shall come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So again, the Jews are always the one to get the wrath of these guys, but especially Antiochus IV. Just like when Antiochus Epiphanes you know, gets bummed out, he goes and wars against the Jews, the Antichrist. When he goes to be worshiped in the temple of Jerusalem, the abomination of desolation, then he goes to war against the Jews, just the same. So we're tracking this, the people of the covenant. Verse 31, and arms shall stand on his part um, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength uh, and take away the daily sacrifice and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Okay, now wait a minute, Brett, I'm confused. So Antichrist commits the abomination of desolation? Yes, that's what we're talking about here in verse 31. Um, now you say, okay, Brett, uh, this Antiochus Epiphanes guy, interesting, you know. Um, here's the thing, uh, Antiochus, remember, let's just kind of break down some, a few things about this guy again. Um, so this is the guy you gotta know, uh, and he comes from the solution side, but remember the Jews called him the madman. Instead of Epiphanes, they called him Epimanes, uh, the mad, because he was so crazy, he came and glorified himself as God, just like Antiochus Theos, he believed himself to be a God. Um, so he's, worship, he's saying, you gotta worship me as God. The Jews said, man, this guy's Epimanes, the madman. And he makes war against the Jews. Now this guy, when he goes into the temple in Jerusalem and commits this, I'm gonna call it the abomination of desolation 1.0. Um, because this really is the same thing. Remember the story? We've talked about this recently where he goes in and kills the priest that wouldn't drink the pig's blood on the temple steps. Uh, the, you know, this Jadua, this priest was killed and, um, and basically smeared pig's blood all over the, the temple in Jerusalem. This guy was crazy, hated the Jews. But if you remember, that's what sparked this whole thing. The, son of, the sons of the priest well, they were a little group of guys that led and really began this Maccabean revolt against Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV. And that's where the story of Hanukkah and the Festival of Lights and all that came from. Okay, are you still with me on that? And it's interesting because Jesus celebrated the Festival of Lights there in Jerusalem, remembering this, this moment. So that's kind of interesting. It's all tied together. So you got Antiochus Epiphanes who commits the abomination of desolation. Verse 32, we go on. And it says in verse 32, and such as do wickedly against the covenant, the Jews, shall he corrupt by flatteries, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Um, who, who are those people that know their God and will do, do good exploits? That's the sons of the priests, the Maccabean revolt. The Lord gave them that strength. Um, and this was prophesied long before um, it ever even happened, uh, which is great. Verse 33, and they that understand among the people shall uh, instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. Many Jews, uh, some people, you know, there's different numbers you'll come across to how many Jews were killed, uh, but it was in the 100,000 or more Jews. Some even say up to a million Jews were killed by Antiochus Epiphanes. Um, depends on who you read. Verse 34, now, when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help but many shall cleave to them with flatteries and some of them uh, of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white even to the time of the end because it is yet for a time appointed. Now this is where the language starts to change here. Um, you know, when you're talking about the Ptolemies and Solutions and all, Cleopatra and all these people, we're, we're seeing history just kind of fly by, but now we're starting to use a language about the end. It says that right there in verse 35. Um, because it is yet for a time appointed. The Lord has an appointed time for the end. What kind of a gear are we switching? I believe verse 35 is where we go from abomination 1.0 to the abomination of desolation 2.0. It's a dual fulfillment of prophecy. Well, Brett, I think you're making that up. I think you're just trying to make this all fit. Well, question, who talked about the future abomination of desolation in the Bible? We got in the book of Revelation. So John talked about it coming in the future. John was long after this 1.0. John lived long time, but even more importantly, who else said something about the abomination of desolation? 
Jesus. Yeah, jot this down in your notes. This is where it gets really important. In Matthew 24, Jesus, remember they asked him, when's the end of the world, Jesus? When's the end of the world? And Jesus, you know, all these things about wars, rumors of wars, diverse uh, earthquakes in diverse places, you know, and this long list of things that's gonna happen. But there in verse 15 and 16, Jesus said, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Now, this is great because this is where Jesus makes it clear, abomination of desolation 1.0, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes smearing pig's blood and killing Jadua and all that stuff. That was the first one. But Daniel was speaking of a multi-layered prophecy with ripple effects. And he's, and, and he's speaking about the end of the world now in verses 36 all the way to the end. We're talking about Antichrist, not Antiochus Epiphanes. Um, and that's the one that Jesus is referring to. There are those that try to make the argument that it all was fulfilled in uh, this time of Antiochus Epiphanes, you know, in the 170s, uh, you know, BC. Um, the Maccabean Revolt happened in 165 BC. Um, but, but, you know, the, the shifting of the language to the time of the end, this is such a key. This is the important part that we need to remember, that um, Jesus talked about this. I love it, by the way, when professors, remember I told you about the Septuagint? It's a good argument why the Dan book of Daniel is not a forgery. Another good argument that I enjoy is when the professors say, well, you know, the book of Daniel was a, f a forgery. It wasn't really written by Daniel. And the reason they say that is because the timing, it's impossible in their brain. Um, but then I like to say, now in Matthew 24, Mr. Professor, um, Jesus said, even as Daniel the prophet wrote, and then he talked about the abomination of desolation. Um, do you know more about the, the Bible than Jesus? Do you know more about the, old, the Hebrew Old Testament than Jesus? And the professor has to say, yes, I do. Um, if he's gonna keep with going on with his nonsense. And I love that because that, most students, I mean, even some secular people are like, wow, you're claiming to know more than Jesus? Whew. Uh, most people, even the, the nominal Christians, kind of like, yeah, that's kind of crossing a line. So I like that argument because it forces a person to say, um, yeah, I, I know more than Jesus Christ about the Bible. Um, Jesus knew what he was talking about because Jesus is God and he's speaking. And, and by the way, this phrase in the middle of verse 15 or at the end of verse 15, whoso readeth, let him understand. The implication there with that phrase, why would that little parenthetical phrase be, phrase be put in there? It's because it's, it's hard. It's a, it's a difficult thing to understand. Jesus is giving that to us. Whosoever reads this, let him understand. Figure it out is kind of the idea. Um, he's saying, you know, Daniel wrote about the abomination of desolation, but that's still yet to happen. And then Jesus says, when that happens in the end, because remember the context of Matthew 24 is the end of the world. When's the end of the world? And Jesus is talking about that. So what do you do when you're a Jew? Because remember, he's not talking to the church because the church is not gonna be there. But Jesus is talking to the Jews and he says, when you see this abomination, when the Antichrist stands in the holy place and we, we went over all that prophecy update, how he's gonna set himself up in the temple to be worshiped, his mark, Number 666, it's all gonna be part of the deal. Uh, you can't buy or sell. He's gonna, setting up an image. There's all kinds of things. Jesus is referring to that moment. And so what are the Jews supposed to do? Then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. And we learned even on uh, Sunday what mountains they are, the mountains of Edom and Moab in modern day Jordan, where the Jews will flee to Petra and that region of uh, Selah, Basra, that whole region. Um, and the Lord's gonna protect them there. So I love how this, this even though this chapter is kind of like ah, a little bit schizophrenic on uh, leaders and Antiochuses and Ptolemies and Cleopatra and Bernice and all these things. What's amazing, 100, we just went over 135 specific things that the Bible said would happen and it did precisely exactly the way it is. One other thing you should note, um, by the time we get to verse 35, the, the history of Antiochus and the Ptolemies is over. And that's what's, that's what's intriguing to me because, uh, you know, if, you're, if you don't understand, you know, history and, and you're watching this, I wonder if there were Jews going, wow, look at, this is all happening just like our Bible says. I wonder if they were tracking it. But then after Antiochus IV, as they were reading it, there's more prophecies, verses 36 through the end of the chapter, and it's, it doesn't match up anymore. It's like the, 
the, the thing just doesn't work. And, and that's because of the gap. What's the gap? The church age. You know, the Roman Empire would come in, uh, you know, shortly after Antiochus and take over and conquer the Jews, scatter them all over the world. It's that gap that we're talking about. So uh, if, you, if you were trying to track the story in those days, you'd say, why is it not going the way the Bible said? You'd think it took an erroneous turn in verse 36. It didn't because of the gap. Are you guys still with me on that? That's important to know. Um, so all that to say, Jesus said this is gonna happen just like the prophet Daniel said it would happen. Now in chapter 12, we'll see uh, the, the rest of the story and how it's all gonna go. And, uh, and, and this is why I think also in chapter 12, Daniel's told over and over again, shut up the words of the book until the time of the end. You're not gonna understand all this stuff until we get closer to the end. That's why I think Daniel's making more and more sense as we see the, the world unfold today. And we're seeing the book of Daniel unsealed. It was sealed up. Even Daniel doesn't understand you know, what, he, what he's reading for the most part or writing or hearing. But we do now because we're looking retrospectively at most of it. Anyway, Bible's amazing. Once again, I uh, hope I didn't bore you to death with all that history. Uh, but it's right there, spelled out. Um, Lord, we're so thankful for your word that is interesting and, and especially this passage of history that you know exactly what was gonna happen. Um, it makes us realize that you've ordered our, our own steps and our own lives are already um, known to you, Lord. What a, what a strange thing that you know all things and that you know our future, but at the same time, we have this free will that you give us and we have decisions that we can make, but you already predetermined and knew. Lord, that mystery of divine election and predestination and all that, Lord, your sovereignty, um, it, it just speaks of your glory, that you're bigger than anything we can imagine, that your wisdom is way past our wisdom. Your thoughts are not our thoughts, but they're, they're wiser than our thoughts. And you've revealed that, Lord, even in your word. We see your fingerprints on this section of scripture as we do so much of the book, Lord, just how you've inspired this whole book cover to cover. So Lord, I pray that this would stir our hearts as we might just be, Lord, living in the, in the last days. You know, you know all things, but, um, but we wanna live accordingly. We wanna live on fire for you, serving you, walking with you. Lord, just give us a new fervor and a faith just to be uh, faithful in these days. Like Daniel, even though we may not understand everything, I pray that we'd still be faithful and walk with you, Lord. So bless these, your people who've carved out this night and studied a difficult passage. We just commit it all to you in Jesus' name, amen.